baptisms and talking with our young kids, that's about the best of all. It doesn't get a whole lot better than that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now we have a lot of visitors here today who weren't here last week. But last week we had Bishop Tom here, Bishop of our Synod here in the ELCA. And Bishop Tom did a really good sermon. Much longer than mine is going to be, by the way, but it was a really good sermon. And he told an Ole and Lena joke. That doesn't mean I'm going to tell one. But he mentioned that he very seldom told Ole and Lena jokes because they're so old. And they really are. They're really old. Now, I very seldom tell Ole and Lena jokes, but it's for a different reason. Not because they're so old, but because usually when I'm telling an Ole and Lena joke, guess who's there? All kinds of Norwegians. And Norwegians often just don't get it. <laughs> now, I am a Norwegian. Full-blooded, so I can say that. And actually, because we're good at poking fun of our, at ourselves, it's okay if the rest of you say it too. But, just to kind of illustrate my point, at a family reunion, oh, maybe 15 odd years ago, Cindy and I were sitting there, and I won't tell you whose side of the family it was on, but one of my sisters-in-law told a joke, <laughs> and she said she had to talk real slow because of all the Norwegians. Now, we're all Norwegians in that family. Well, about 15 minutes later, one of our great aunts just started laughing and laughing. And she says, I get it. She's real slow because you're all Norwegian. <laughs> and that kind of proves the point. <laughs> now, here this morning, we've got Peter and James and John. And they go up on the mountain with Jesus for a transformational experience. Jesus is transfigured. And the disciples, even though they don't really realize it, are in the process of transformation. Transformation. Now, I used to think, and I'm still kind of thinking it, Peter must be Norwegian, because he just doesn't seem to get it. Not only here, but whenever you read about Peter, his heart is in the right place all through the Gospels, but he just doesn't seem to get it. Well, and we can relate to that, those of us especially who are Norwegians. Picture the scene for a moment, up on the mountain, the three of them with Jesus. Jesus is suddenly transfigured, his clothes dazzling white, as our gospel describes them. And if that's not enough, suddenly Elijah and Moses are there with Jesus, the greatest of the prophets, the one who is to appear before the Messiah, comes again. And with him, the prophet who led the people out of bondage in Egypt into the promised land, the one that they call the lawgiver. And Peter seems to be able. It is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings. But you know what? I often thought of it as kind of babbling, but I don't think that anymore. I don't think that he was babbling at all. Oh, he didn't get it. He didn't get it fully and completely, as they say. But you know what? You see an experience like that, you can be a little bit terrified. And I think what's happening here is Peter suddenly falls back on his Jewish roots because the Jewish people believed that God would come and dwell with them, tabernacle with them, live with them again. Just like from the Gospel of John, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The Word became flesh and lived among us. They're expecting God, and after experience like that, they're expecting God to live with them. Well, let's make three dwellings. Makes totally good sense to me. And the root of the word that we translate there, dwelling, actually comes from the same root as dwelt and lived and tabernacled. So, I think Peter is, he's not babbling at all. He's terrified, but he's going back to his Jewish roots. Now, thinking about this, whether Peter is intentionally or not honoring the traditions of his people, he's also having a mountaintop experience. Literally, a mountaintop experience. You're on the mountain and you see Jesus before you, and who on earth would want this to end? Of course you'd want it to continue. You want to make a dwelling place there and be able to live in the moment for the rest of your life. 
Peter doesn't want it to end, and I'm guessing James and John didn't want it to end, and I think that if we were there, we wouldn't want it to end either. Those of you who were here last week have kind of an idea as to what I'm talking about. We had over 400 people in worship as Pastor Andy was installed. Bishop Tom was here wearing his red cope. Seven or eight pastors with us, all dressed in white, not dazzling white, but pretty white, kind of like the alb I've got on, and all wearing red stoles. We want to stay. We want to stay and build our dwellings on a mountaintop experience like that. But we can't do that. We have to come down from the mountain. Now for Peter and James and John, six days before their mountaintop experience, Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ. Now, this transfiguration experience, it confirms Peter's confession. And it is a high point, pun intended, a high point between Jesus' baptism on the one hand and the crucifixion on the other. But Peter, James, and John miss the point. And, of course, this same theme, the disciples kind of missing the point, not quite getting it, is repeated all through the Gospels. And it's not a whole lot different today, my friends. It's really not a whole lot different today. 2,000 years later, we sometimes miss the point. You know, other things that we want to do, we want to keep those special days like last Sunday, like this Sunday, First Communion, very special. Baptism, very special. We want to keep these as a shot in the arm, as a spiritual shot in the arm. We don't want to go back to the routine we want to stay in the moment of a great experience like this. But you know, the way life is, it's really not about the dramatic experiences. Dramatic experiences are not normative. And let me tell you, contrary to anything else you might hear, your faith is not lacking if you don't have dramatic experiences on a regular basis. Now, both Moses and Elijah had had mountaintop experiences before. And now they appear in another mountaintop experience. Jesus is, or God is setting the stage for the greatest revelation of God's glory. A revelation that takes place through a human being, the one we call the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus. And God says, this is my Son. This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. God is in the midst of life. He's not speaking through the law as given by Moses, nor is he speaking through words from a prophet. But God is there speaking. And we see what he does manifested in a human being, not at a distance, but in the flesh. God's word becomes flesh. Wow, what an experience. And then Peter, James, and John have to come down from the mountain. And the transfiguration, as we know, leads to pain and suffering and the cross. And here we acknowledge that pain and suffering are sometimes our lot as well. They come of following Jesus. They come of bearing our own crosses. But this is what it means to be a disciple. This is what it means to be called by Jesus, even if it looks like we're out of step with the rest of the world. Because the truth of the matter is, you bet we are out of step with the rest of the world. Following Jesus means following him on his way to the cross. It means following him on his way to the tomb. It means following him as he goes to the resurrection. Following Jesus means that we're here Sunday morning and Quite often during the week, it means that we do lots of things related to being a disciple of Jesus during the week. We stand with the poor. We speak for those who have no voice in society. We look at what we buy. We look at what we eat, the ways we spend our money, the ways we raise our children. And Yeah, if it means that we're out of step with the world, so be it. We are out of step with the world. This coming Wednesday is a case in point. This is the week that we, or the Wednesday that we call Ash Wednesday, and everybody who's here is going to be marked with the cross of Christ on their forehead. You'll be reminded that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, for those of us who 
go elsewhere following a service like that, going shopping or to a restaurant or something like that, well, there are people there who will look at you kind of askance. Oh, must be Christians. Well, who wants to follow a tradition that reminds you that you are dust and to dust you will return? You know, that's the truth of the matter. And we need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of it. It's the way of the cross. It means following Jesus as a disciple. Yes, it's out of step. Yes, it can be countercultural. It can be difficult. It can be upsetting. It means that sometimes you don't go with the flow. Sometimes you do make waves. But the thing is, the thing is, brothers and sisters, we do what is pleasing to God. Now, to follow Christ, to do as he did, to teach, to heal, to forgive, to bear witness to the forgiving love that is revealed in Christ Jesus, that's what we're all about. Our task is to tell others about the glory of God, to share the good news with those around us, the purpose of our faith isn't to have repeated spectacular experiences, dramatic mountaintop experiences. No, the purpose of our faith, the task of our faith, is to tell others. And moved by the Holy Spirit, given in baptism, nourished by Scripture and the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit calls us to reflect God's glory in our lives. I know we have doubts, questions, fears. We're not always loving and forgiving. We have failings. We have shortcomings. We suffer from discouragement at times. And you know what? We share all these things with the original disciples. And like them, we have the same answer, an answer given by God, the answer to everything, Christ Jesus. Not only our example, but the giver of our call to follow, the giver of our power to follow. Christ renews us, he forgives us when we fail. And that's the point. Jesus through the cross and the resurrection makes it possible for you and me to be transfigured as God's beloved children here and now. Amen. Amen.